You're live with Get Connected. Mike Agarbo here with John Beeler. We're broadcasting from our home studios. We have a really awesome show today. Later on in the program, uh, we will be talking with the uh, folks over at uh, Open Farm Pet Foods and how they are coping with the uh, coronavirus uh, as far as their business. And a really interesting uh, interview with our good friend uh, Peter Vogel here. He's a local tech expert and uh, physics uh, teacher. We're going to be talking about Starlink, and this is fascinating. Starlink is a, uh, a company from Elon Musk who is launching thousands of low-Earth orbit satellites to bring internet to everyone around the world. In the future, you may not uh, have to get your internet through your local ISP like a TELUS, Rogers, or Bell, or Shaw. It can come from space. The challenge, though, is literally he's going to need tens of thousands of these things up there. And astronomers are losing their mind because they're saying that it could be blocking their view of the uh, the heavens. So we'll uh, find out all about that. In the news this week, uh, a lot of stuff uh, happening, uh, John. I know this one is your, uh, your favorite because you are Mr. Catman. Uh, Samsung's new TV packaging can be recycled into creating uh, fun furniture for your uh, your living room for your cat yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> the most important thing for you <laughs> i think this is brilliant because i literally last weekend uh had to break down the the tv box that i i bought a, a 55 inch tv a while ago at a, at a, a crazy sale price and it's been sitting in my garage forever and i finally said i gotta get rid of this and it would have been amazing to turn that into basically a cat playground um, without me having to cut it up manually and assemble it all. Um, they've got some pre-cut patterns on the back of the boxes now. And so you break it down and then your cat has something to play with while you're setting up your TV, which is, which is fantastic. Plus then it's much more manageable than having to uh, cut down a much bigger box like I had to do on the weekend. This is going to be available just on some select TVs right now, but I'm sure uh, that if it's popular, they'll uh, roll it out to <laughs> their other uh, TVs. Uh, but not only can you make a cat house, uh, you can also make a, a magazine rack or uh, a little stand for your entertainment uh, units. You, know, you put your like PlayStation and stuff uh, into it. <laughs> it's going a little bit below the Ikea level of furniture, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if I'd want like cardboard uh, furniture in my in my living room. The cat house, I kind of get because that's kind of fun. Yeah, uh, like, and the, the cat will destroy it and then you, you'll you recycle it. You know, like it, it'll get multiple uses. Um, a magazine stand, not so sure. Yeah. With Samsung written all over it. <laughs> <laughs> Times are yeah. tough, eh, Mike? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> After about the TV, couldn't afford anything else. Maybe you can turn it into a Tesla, a cardboard Tesla. Yeah, exactly. Uh, another interesting story, it, all the events this year have been canceled. Uh, John, we usually go to a bunch of uh, trade shows throughout the uh, the year. I'm super disappointed that I won't be able to, to go to a lot of these because, you know, we get a lot of information and it's kind of fun to travel. Uh, one that you've been to before, John, uh, PAX West, they intend to go on. I believe they're uh, they have one in September and this is one that you actually got sick at before back in I the did. day. I did the first time I went to it and this is in Seattle, which uh, in Washington state, I guess has been one of the epicenters of the um, COVID-19 breakout. And uh, so they're still planning. I mean, the, the problem is with a lot of these big events, they have to plan months, if not a year in advance, just to make sure all the bookings are in, and everything's lined up and stuff like that. But uh, this is a, a very, fun event it's a very hands-on event for for gaming enthusiasts cosplay people those types of um uh people so it's there's a lot of people in one place and this just sounds like a really bad idea to at least be entertaining the thought of having the show go on right now when you know Germany has canceled Oktoberfest, which is later than this um and arguably is you know a, a bigger deal um but uh, yeah, I mean, I, on the one hand, I understand organizers have a tough place. Having been uh, an event organizer myself, it's very difficult to get all the all the things to line up and all your cats herded and that type of thing. Uh, especially, I can only imagine how difficult it is right now uh, in these circumstances. But 
it just doesn't make any sense to, you know, announce that you're going to try to do it anyways. And I, I was looking at some of the comments on Twitter and most people are like, uh, I love this event, but I'm not going like, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, or other people are like super excited and like they seem oblivious to the fact that we're living in a pandemic pandemic right now. So I, I don't know. Like uh, I, I suspect, and you know, PAX has been a fairly good and, and, and uh, safe place for a lot of people to go as far as, you know, gender issues and all those kinds of things. And, and gamer culture has been, you know, mostly positive there. And, to have this kind of thing over it, it just seems weird to me. We'll uh, be following that and see what happens in the, the coming weeks uh, and months. This was uh, something that uh, was interesting to me, John. Uh, Google is rolling out a Hey Google sensitivity feature for their, uh, their Google Home devices. <laughs> so the fact that you just triggered all of them might not I happen did. as much. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. My, my wife uh, loves and hates the Google home that we, we have, uh, she's finally loving it because of the music feature. Cause she can just ask it to play any music or playlist. And so when she's working in the kitchen, uh, you know, doing stuff, it, it's just, it's a dream to her, but she just hates that anything is listening in our house. So when the music is not playing, it's, she hates it more right. than anything. And, the big reason is because it kind of goes off uh, by itself without anyone saying the the wake up words. Yeah, and yeah. And so, so you wonder, just, you wonder that's, what that's what the justification, you what know, triggered yeah, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I've heard one of my Alexa devices. I, I have one in my in my main bathroom because um, I like to put music on in there. Like if you have a bath or something like that, and every once in a while, like I'll be in another part of the house and I swear I hear her talking in there. I'm like. <laughs> no one's been in there. No one is anywhere. In, and I haven't even said anything because I'm the only one in the house. Why is she talking? And I don't know. I think we know why, John. <laughs> Either your cat has uh, become <laughs> uh, uh, able to, to speak or there's ghosts. Probably both. Probably both. Uh, so don't have the exact time frame when this is going to be rolling out, but uh, you'll be able to apparently when this does roll out, adjust how sensitive uh, your Google Home is to hearing the wake words to activate. Uh, this is kind of uh, interesting, John. Uh, Netflix is now worth more than Disney. Which is crazy when you think about that. Yeah. yeah. They uh, had their latest uh, quarter. They uh, brought Usually, uh, they bring in about 7 million subscribers per quarter. Uh, analysts estimated that they do a little bit more, uh, I think 8.2 million this year it, in this, this quarter. Uh, they brought in 15 million new global paid subscribers. So why haven't the conspiracy theorists said that Netflix created the virus? <laughs> it's coming, John. It's coming. <laughs> They are now worth $190 billion. And uh, the, the finance people say there's a few reasons for that. Number one, it's all paid subscriptions. They don't have to rely on any other revenue like Disney. Disney has to rely on advertising revenue, which is mm -hmm. not the greatest uh, right now because they've got all the different broadcast uh, offerings. Plus, uh, all their parks are closed down right now, which yeah. obviously generates uh, a lot. I think a, a third of their revenue, which is a huge hit. It's all those chocolate covered bananas. Right. So one of their big shows, uh, if unless you've been living in a, under a rock, Tiger King. Do you know how many people watched in the first month? Apparently everybody on my Facebook feed. <laughs> 64 million people. 64 million people watched Tiger King. That train wreck of, <laughs> of, a, of a show. I, I, I can't even bring myself to watch it. It just oh, looks... Oh, you got to watch a couple episodes. I've seen enough of the memes though. Like it just, it just, uh, and it's as bad as you, as you know, that, and that's why I have better things to do with my time. <laughs> okay. We're going to have to take a break. When we come back, we will be talking with our good friend, Peter Vogel about Starlink. Elon Musk is launching thousands of low earth satellites uh, into space to bring internet to the masses. Uh, and especially in areas that can't get internet or high speed uh, internet. But uh, there are some detractors. Uh, the astronomers don't like it because they say it will block their view of the stars. When we come back, all about Starlink. You're listening to Get Connected here on the Chorus Radio Network. Back after this.
Let's talk about satellites now. We've got a great guest. Uh, our good friend uh, Peter Vogel is in studio with us. And uh, he is a technology expert and writer and physics teacher here in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on air. I wanted to talk about uh, Starlink or Project Starlink. And, you know, some people know about this, uh, but this is a- another one of Elon Musk's uh, projects. You know him from Tesla and Solar City and SpaceX. And uh, now he is launching satellites uh, into uh, Earth orbit. Uh, tell our listeners... Why? Why is he getting into the satellite game? So it's a, it's a multi-pronged vision that uh, Elon Musk has, uh, ultimately ending with him putting a constellation of satellites around Mars. He hopes to get to Mars before he dies. Yes. <laughs> that uh, may uh, be difficult to, to pull off. In any case, Starlink is his uh, plan to deliver uh, internet across the Earth, cheaply, low latency, Uh, through a network of thousands of satellites, small satellites, about a quarter ton each, uh, low Earth orbit, 500 to 1,500 kilometers. And he's already put 300 in orbit. There's 300 satellites up there already. He launches 60 at a time. Okay. Uh, They have a factory in Renton uh, in Washington State. They crank out six a day. Uh, They have a stockpile of several hundred. And how many satellites does he need to get up there to make this viable? Uh, he says he can uh, run uh, his initial uh, tests at around 1,000 satellites, and he'll be doing that later this year, Canada and uh, the United States, northern Canada, actually. Um, and Musk, of course, has ties to Canada. His very first job was in Vancouver working in a lumber mill, so he has strong affinity here. Um, he has permits for, I believe, 4,000 satellites. He has applied for 12, and he needs 42,000 eventually. Baby steps. <laughs> Baby steps, yes. Internet by satellite's not new. It is not new. Uh, however, it has been an area fraught with bankruptcies, uh, failures. It's a difficult thing to do. No one has been able to pull off low latency, large networks. Uh, we, we've had Iridium satellites that went bankrupt virtually at They large. were like satellite phone service. Satellite phone service. Why did they fail, in your opinion? Uh, I, I don't think they could get the customers. The radios were expensive. The plans were expensive. Uh, the plan, yeah, the, the whole thing was expensive. There were, the network was 77 satellites or so, not enough for continuous uh, communication. You, you needed something uh, lower and, and, and so forth. And, and Iridium had controversy uh, as well with uh, light reflecting uh, brightly off its uh, antennas. And so that's something we want to talk about as well. Uh, I guess astronomers here on Earth are concerned that uh, these satellites are reflecting too much light back to Earth and blocking their efforts to see out into the cosmos. The the, the problem is is multi-pronged uh, again. Yes, the astronomers are upset, particularly if there are thousands of these. They, they think that any at any given time, there'll be a thousand in their field of view uh, on these wide view uh, telescopes. And they've printed photos showing uh, a network of these satellites obscuring a, a large sky photo in South America. Whether whether or not uh, that can be mitigated remains to be seen. M- Musk says he's confident he can control the problem. Um, he's done things such as painting satellites black. Hmm, that's a problem because black uh, causes heat uh, issues in space. The, the craft overheats. It's, it's, oh, it's perfect. traditionally not done. Okay. <laughs> so it hasn't been thought through fully. And this is the argument from the International Astronomers Union. It needs to be thought through before he proceeds with the next thousand or more of these uh, launches. But he had to get permission from somewhere. Like, who's giving him yes. the permission to, to right. launch the, these the, things? Ultimately, the permission comes strangely from uh, the um, FAA, I believe, in America. Uh, so flight uh, and so forth. And I think there's an FCC communications uh, uh, approval. But no one had actually thought through the uh, business of um, uh, astronomy problems. Really, it was given no thought. So these satellites, um, I guess the first batch, they were reflecting. Yes, in fact, quite, I, quite I a saw lot. them myself. Yeah, I remember reading on Facebook you were saying you saw them. It was it was spectacular. Uh, if I had not known, I would have said we were under invasion. Uh, <laughs> And I saw them at midnight uh, in an industrial park. I knew they would be crossing. I pulled over under a streetlight and was able to see these things, and it was stunning to me. Even under a streetlight? 
even under a street light. Oh, wow. That now, this, this was a day from launch. Yeah. These, these things uh, have to move up into launch uh, or into um, final position. Antennas are tweaked and all this kind of stuff that, that ultimately changes that visibility. Yeah. So a day later, you couldn't see them. What type of material is causing that much reflection? It's it's the antennas on them and their physical size. Yeah. They're, they're not small. They're a quarter ton each. Some people think they're shoebox size. No, they're not. They're, they're large. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the physical uh, components, the solar panels on them, uh, cause reflection. Yeah. Now, this, this problem goes way back to 1960 when the Americans launched Echo 1, which... My, my father took me out to see this. I vividly remember it, and it uh, sent me on a lifelong fascination with space. And, in fact, here in the studio, I have a piece of, of mylar from uh, the original um, Echo Balloons, as they were called. And this was given to me by a, a NASA fellow. I'm, I'm showing this here in the studio. Ultra, ultra-thin material. Oh, and wow. it was a 100-foot yeah. balloon. It's like thin tinfoil. Like thin tinfoil. But yeah. at that time, unknown. It, it required new physics to deposit uh, aluminum onto what became called mylar. Yeah. The, the name became the Is that the like a plastic? Or? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So this was a 100-foot balloon. They then developed a 135-foot balloon, and uh, this was visible over the entire Earth. It was the very first man-made object visible from space. Yeah. So, Is it, it still up there? No. 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 It, it and its sister uh, came down late in the 60s, but... And, and here's a, an interesting point, uh, a corollary to the experiments with um, ECHO, they were using it to bounce microwave off, so it wasn't an active satellite. Uh, the, the, the antenna that they developed later led to the Nobel Prize in Physics for discovering the cosmic microwave background, which was oh, the wow. for okay. the, the Big Bang. Yeah. So this is this interplay. Astronomers say, from this we're plastic. important to physics. <laughs> Uh, Elon, you need to respect the work that we do. Uh, without our work, you wouldn't wouldn't have your satellites in orbit. Yeah. So he's launching all of these things up there. Do you think there is a solution to have them not reflect so much light? I mean, if he's going to get 40,000 of them up there, and he's not the only guy. There's competitors out there as well. That's right. There are three main companies. Uh, I think he uh, has, has the, the greatest number uh, in, in, in plans. It, it's difficult to say. He's confident that he can uh, can pull it off. Uh, he's known for bravado, and uh, certainly we can't uh, f fault him for uh, innovation uh, in many, many spheres. So I think we'll give him the benefit of the doubt for now. Um, the, 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 the low albedo new black ones that he's uh, launched are, are just recently, he's launching another compliment, I think, Saturday, uh, so, so this week uh, as we speak. Um, He's working on it. It's, it's a work in progress, shall we say. Do they have, like, some sort of space traffic control up there? Like, when you've they, got, they, like, tens of thousands of these they, things. They, they do. Uh, they do. And, and this, there's some maneuverability to these. And so he has talked about maneuvering them out of critical uh, astronomical experiments. He's also talked about the astronomers using data processing to track these things. After all, if a Raspberry Pi can track 100 aircraft, presumably a supercomputer can track 42,000 satellites with relatively little problem. But there's overhead, there's cost involved, there's time, there's effort, there's money, there are people that have to be employed to, to do this data processing and filter out this material. But he's hoping to make a lot of money out of this. He hopes to make $30 billion a year. Profit. $30 billion a year profit. And he intends to plow that all back into SpaceX, the vision being to get SpaceX to Mars. And he already has plans to put Starlink in orbit around Mars to develop an Internet at Mars, shall we say. Uh, that, that's his long-term vision. How much do you think it'll cost to get John to Mars? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's based on the pound. <laughs> it's a little bit extra. <laughs> we better cut down on the beer. We better. I, I, I think. Um, I'm interested to see how well the, this uh, satellite uh, internet service will work because I, I remember back in the 90s, uh, my former business partner lived out in Abbotsford and that's all he could get was satellite internet. And sure. it, I mean, great, he got internet, but it sucked <laughs> really right, badly. Right, and so, so Musk believes he can get low latency, 20 uh, uh, millisecond. And what do we used to hear? 10, 10 to 20 yeah. is, is, is not unusual. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so he believes he can do that, and he believes he can do, do it at gigabit speeds. 
Now, the aircraft uh, people are after him because if he can do it to Earth, he can also deliver it to aircraft. And oh. Internet to aircraft is, is really a problem at this point. Yeah. So if you can get a, mega, uh, a gigabit feed into a plane, you've got the potential to have all the passengers watching Netflix simultaneously. You only need five megabits or so. Yeah. So th apparently that is another area where he intends to make a, a large amount of money. So people like so the satellite internet service will get right into the plane. Exactly. They don't have to have any equipment on there. It will be a dedicated antenna. Is all it will be yeah. just just as on Earth. He already claims he has his antennas ready. He says they're basically a pizza plate sized antenna. He says it comes with two instructions: plug in, aim at sky. It takes care this of this. Will disrupt the whole uh, airplane internet business. It will disrupt that business, but um, better it will bring internet to areas of the world that traditionally don't have it. Do you have any insight as to what this would cost? I have nothing along those lines. Yeah. At the consumer end, I presume you're right. asking. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think they've unveiled anything like that, but presumably if they're going to roll that out in northern Canada, we're not talking hundreds of dollars a month. It no. It just won't be viable. No. Uh, we, we really don't know. Yeah. But yeah. presumably that's part of their, their next phase. We, we believe they're running tests in Canada uh, later in 2020. Well, it's kind of exciting. So, um, what's what's the overall rollout plan like? When when did he say that this will all be kind of actually up and running? Uh, I don't think there's a defined date. Each launch that they've had so far of the four, there's been some delay. Uh, so they're averaging around 1.3 satellites a month, yeah. uh, launches a month okay. of 60 satellites each. They need to get this down to the one every two or three days. Yeah. So we've got a way to go. I think we're looking at half a dozen years. Well, exciting uh, times. We're talking with Peter Vogel. He is a tech writer, physics teacher, tech expert uh, out of Vancouver here, and uh, all about the Project Starlink uh, from Elon Musk launching tens of thousands of satellites uh, into low uh, Earth orbit to provide internet access to uh, the planet, and especially in remote areas, essentially. Yep. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. You are back with Get Connected. Mike Agarbo here with John Beeler, broadcasting from our home studios. Well, it's uh, it's been a challenging time uh, over the past few weeks for many of us. Uh, I know myself included. I uh, I get a little stressed out sometimes, uh, a little anxious about uh, what the future holds uh, for us. Obviously, uh, you know, talking to friends and family uh, very helpful. Uh, you know, if you've got pets as well, uh, they can uh, relieve a lot of stress. I've got uh, two little dogs, Maeve and Rosie, and uh, they are a never-ending source of joy and comfort. But, uh, you know, what if you do need uh, extra help? Well, we want to talk with some folks uh, from a company here in Canada that are helping Canadians uh, in that regard. They're called Open Farm Pet. We have on the line right now one of the co-founders. Her name is Jacqueline Prehogan. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, you self-describe yourself uh, as uh, a crazy dog lady as well. I am absolutely a crazy dog lady. I am mom to three pugs. Uh, recently, also mom to a little human as well. Um, and yeah, my whole life, you know, my number one passion has been animals. And I always knew I wanted to like build my life, my career around them. So very fortunate to do what I do and just, you know, make things for dogs every single day. Well, you're actually helping Canadians by offering uh, uh, some free counseling through a service. Before we get there, uh, tell us a little bit about Open Farm Pet. Sure. So uh, we are a family business and we're headquartered here in Toronto. Um, and basically our mission is to produce very premium foods for pets uh, using exceptional ingredients that are ethically sourced and also completely traceable. So we offer kind of a different level of transparency. Um, but, you know, for, for me and my husband, my brother-in-law, um, who are the, the founders of the business, you know, we view it as more than just a business. It's a platform for us to have a positive impact. And the three areas that we focus on are uh, farm animal welfare, the environment, and also having a positive impact on our communities. So you, you sell your products uh, through pet stores and online as well? Yep, correct. Um, we have an amazing network of independent pet stores um, throughout the U.S. and Canada and also on our site, openfarmpet.com. How are you finding business uh, or doing business right now uh, through this uh, pan pandemic? Obviously, people still have to feed their pets. Yeah, well, that's just it. People still need to feed their pets. And 
Um, if anything, you know, we're seeing rates of pet adoption and fostering going up. Um, you know, I, obviously a big change for us is the way that people are buying food is shifting because, um, you know, many pet stores are absolutely open, but a lot of people are also going to uh, curbside delivery and local delivery um, from their pet stores. And luckily pet stores are an essential service, which of course they are because they're taking care of our little furry loved ones. Um, so, you know, we're just working with our stores to get our food to pet parents and our stores are doing a phenomenal job of offering, you know, really safe options for people to get what they need and keep their pets nourished. So one of the reasons I wanted to, to bring you on the program is, uh, you were offering, uh, Canadians that are, are struggling right now, uh, some free counseling services through a service. We are, we are. So, you know, I think right now, obviously people are really leaning on their pets uh, for support, which is fantastic. Our pets have an amazingly positive impact on, you know, our mental health and well-being. Um, but in very difficult times, um, like we're obviously going through right now, you know, a lot of people may need more, they may need someone to talk to and more support. And, um, you know, being aware of this, that's how we came up with this idea to partner with an online counseling service called BetterHelp. Um, and basically what we can do um, through this partnership is offer free virtual counseling with a licensed therapist to absolutely anyone that needs it in Canada or the US um, without ever, them ever having to leave their home. Um, it's very simple. Uh, all you have to do is visit openfarmpet.com slash better help to learn more and then get matched with a therapist. How did you come up with this idea? You know, I look around at even my own, you know, bubble. I think we're all a little bit in our own bubbles right now, in our homes, you know, in our networks. And, you know, even within my network, looking at friends, family, colleagues, um, you know, we are not getting that human contact that we're used to, that we crave. We're social animals, right? And I think that no matter how you slice it, that has an impact on us. And um, at the end of the day, you know, we're very big uh, proponents of mental health and how important it is to take care of that, you know, each and every one of us. And we were just inspired by, you know, the opportunity to hopefully have an impact. And we felt there was something we could do. And so we did it. So how do people take advantage of this? Yep. So it's very simple. Um, simply go to our site, which is openfarmpet.com slash better help. Um, and there's a bunch of information there with next steps. It's super simple. You get paired with a licensed therapist, um, set up an appointment and off you go. And it's completely free. I, I really love talking to business owners uh, right now because, um, you know, it's interesting to see how many of them are adapting uh, to the challenges we're, we're facing right now. Do you have any advice for, for business owners right now to, uh, to maybe expand their community or help their community out, their customers? Yeah, that is, that is such a great question. Um, we actually, you know, recently finished a project um, where we were putting together kind of this toolkit for our independent retailers to just offer kind of ideas and creative ways to evolve their businesses to kind of adapt to this new environment. And I think that there really is a lot that you can do, but as a business, you know, if you're not, for example, as a retail store, you're not having that physical contact with your customers, you need to really think outside the box. Well, how can I still do the things that are important for me, such as, you know, showing my product offering and building customer loyalty and running promotions in a virtual environment. And so, and there are a lot of ways to do that. How can I, you know, serve my customer in a way that they are comfortable, you know, um, whether that's curbside pickup or that's local delivery. So, you know, certainly I've seen in our businesses and, you know, we're seeing it in our retail partners. Everyone has had to act really, really fast to evolve and kind of change, you know, the way that they interact with their customers and of course with each other, with teams and within teams. Um, to to take a lot of that online and still offer that great you know service product or service that makes you who you are as a business, but in a way where the customer is safe and comfortable. It, it is interesting, and I I, I got to be honest, I, I worry for some of these small businesses uh, right now because uh, during these types of times, you know, inevitably they have to push more of their business uh, online. And I don't know if a lot of them really have, uh, you know, robust or built out e-commerce websites or, or, you know, a good 
plan behind that. And I, I kind of worry about some of the big guys, you know, like the Amazons and Walmarts of the world. I mean, they, they've got it down pat. Uh, yeah. You know, will they wipe them out, uh, you know, in, in the long run now? Yeah. And, and look, I think what's really amazing and what I've seen a ton of is like people want to support local businesses. They don't want to just buy from Amazon and from Walmart. Um, you know, so there's been this amazing kind of rally around these businesses and people saying, we want to support you. We want to buy from you in a way that works for us. And there's also a lot of tools out there. Um, you know, one example in our industry, there's actually this um, platform, platform called Etail Pet. Um, and it's specifically for independent pet stores and it helps them to essentially get online um, and serve through pickup and local delivery. It's very fast and easy. And um, that's one particular resource, at least for our channel. You know, I know, for example, Shopify is doing like free trials right now. And they say you can set up a site, I think, in as little as seven days. You know, there are resources and tools out there. It does require absolutely acting fast. We're all kind of getting outside of our comfort zone a little bit um, in terms of having to do things that um, maybe we haven't done before. And so, like I said, I think the good news is people want to absolutely support these stores. They want to buy from them. I think the more that stores can um, utilize the resources that are out there to make, you know, ordering easy through an online platform, through click and collect, through text, through, you know, their site, through Instagram, and really make themselves accessible. Um, that will be kind of the best way that businesses can evolve rapidly right now to serve the customer. So you're basically saying for these small businesses, really get in touch with your, obviously your local customers and community to, to be successful and, 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 and thrive. I always say that uh, when we run into roadblocks in business, they often create like these new opportunities because you need to push yourself to find these new creative solutions. Um, like I said, work outside your, your, your comfort zone and you kind of overcome these obstacles. And then, so suddenly, you know, when things hopefully go back to more normal, suddenly these stores will be hopefully a lot more accessible to their customers. They've kind of overcome this. They figured this out. They're now taking order orders in you know, six ways instead of one, two ways. Um, and they've had to really go above and beyond exactly to engage with their communities. Um, and to, you know, drive that customer loyalty. And so they've done a lot of good things in this time that will carry them forward and create a great basis going forward as well. I, I think, it, <clears throat> sorry, sorry, go ahead, um, John. I was going to say, I, I think one of the interesting things that you touched on there was this quick pivot that everyone's been forced to do in getting uh, up to speed and online with products and services they haven't had to deal with because they had a retail storefront. And one of the things I thought about, and I don't know if this is just a crazy idea, but we use like Uber Eats and Skip the Dishes for our own food. Why couldn't we use that for pet food and stuff like that as well? You might, you might just have uh, gotten a million dollar idea there, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. For sure. And I think that especially with pets, you know, people, like pets are part of our family, right? You know, we, and like I say, it's been amazing. We've been hearing stories about like animal shelters being empty, literally empty because people are at home, they have time, they're fostering, they're adopting. And so, you know, more than ever, people are like at home, like showering their pets with love. You know, they're really not looking to um, kind of reduce the quality of their food or anything like that. And and there's there've been kind of a bunch of, bunch of surveys that show people actually, you know, for example, buy their pets gifts before them. Like they really put their pets first as a, a very valued member of their family. And um, I think that absolutely they're going to continue to look for ways to access great products, whether it be food or other products for their pets. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, great new ideas to, and ways to get them those products uh, will be welcome and, and will probably be very well received by pet parents. Talking with Jacqueline Prehogan. She is uh, one of the founders behind openfarmpet.com, a great website uh, that uh, has all sorts of different types of pet foods uh, for your little furry loved ones. Uh, and uh, they also have a, a great uh, distribution network of uh, local pet stores that uh, sell their products uh, as well. And you can find out where those are. They're also offering uh, free uh, online virtual uh, health services or, or uh, uh, what, what would you call it? Um, a virtual uh, health service? 
It's yeah, it's online. It's online counseling and it's uh, basically free virtual therapy with a licensed therapist. It's for the human, not the dog. <laughs> um, but and, and it's accessible to um, anyone across Canada, the US without ever having to leave your house. So well, much we, to appre- talk to. we appreciate you uh, helping us out. And uh, thanks for joining us on the show today. My absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. When we come back from the break, it's Tech of the Week time. Stay tuned. You're back with Get Connected. Mike and John here in studio. Before we get to Tech of the Week, I want to talk about our contest. We're giving away a Cobra dual cam dash cam system. This thing is all kinds of uh, awesome. It'll track uh, your driving and anything that might uh, happen, good or bad, onto its digital uh, memory. And the nice thing is it's got a camera for both the front and the back of your car. If you want to try to win this, it's super easy. All you have to do is subscribe to our e-newsletter. Go to getconnectedmedia.com, hit the newsletter tab, subscribe. You're entered into all of our contests going uh, forward this year. So literally thousands of dollars of prizes. It's so simple. Again, getconnectedmedia.com, hit the newsletter tab, subscribe. So John, I'm going to do Tech of the Week this week. I know because you're super excited about this feature. Yeah. Uh, I am a Sonos owner. Uh, Sonos is a multi-room speaker system. They've been around for forever now. I had these things, I think, for about 13 years. And what I love about them is that they've got all sorts of different speakers and devices that you can hook up to your existing speakers in your home. And it allows you to easily control music in every room of your home. And it's done through an app on your your phone or your tablet or your computer. Or you can use your voice now as well, uh, either Alexa or uh, Google Home. So they have just rolled out uh, an upgraded radio section of uh, their uh, of their app, and this is kind of cool. From what they're saying, uh, more than half of all the uh, the music being played on their system is actually radio. Which who knew? Who, <laughs> who knew? And so, I mean, you can hook up uh, literally over a hundred different. Uh, streaming services like Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, and I have all those hooked up. But yeah, I do listen to a lot of uh, radio. You know, they've got literally thousands of different radio stations from around the world. Uh, they've got a partnership with Tune, uh, uh, TuneIn, and now they've uh, really bolstered that up. So a couple things, uh, they are going to have uh, artist curated radio stations. So for example, if you like Tom York from Radiohead, he's got his own station where he basically programs all his favorite songs, which is kind of neat, and that's uh, ad-free. They also have their own radio station, uh, the Sonos Sound System. You know, like Apple, uh, they've got the Apple Beats 1 radio station, kind of similar uh, to that. And uh, they will be working with partners like iHeartRadio and uh, TuneIn uh, as well to really curate the, uh, the 60,000 international radio stations. And uh, it, it's cool. I mean, you want to listen to classic rock from Hawaii or you know, news talk from London, it's all there. So uh, again, if you are a Sonos owner, this is definitely the, the thing to check out. Don't forget to listen to our app show uh, as well. Tomorrow, we are going to be talking about price shopping websites. If you want to save some money, especially uh, during the times now, we're going to be telling you about the best ways, apps, and websites to help you do that. That's all the time we have left. I want to thank John and the rest of the crew, Christina, Stephen, Nigel, Paul, and uh, AJ for helping put this all together. We'll see you again next time.